welcoming the president of Human Managed District, David Medallio. Triage doesn't always happen in the song. It also happens in real life. Last June 21, we were in a shop just across nearby yeah, to where we are right now. Here's my daughter. She's one year old. Hit her head on a corner of a table. We had to triage to make a decision. That time, seeing a lot of blood on her face, and we got feedback from our media that the wound looked very deep. We had to decide to go to the ER. Upon arrival, the nurses examined our daughter. They took in signals. They took in, found her age, looked how she was acting, and just her overall disposition. She was generally okay. Because of that, the nurses actually gave our daughter a yellow man. This is the prime that the lifesavers in the ER actually help them handle patient efficiently. So the yellow actually means it's urgent but not life threatening. Similarly, in cybersecurity, we treat alerts the same. We need some sort of priming for our SOC team to handle the alerts properly. But it's easier said than done. So when our SOC team is confronted by 500 million events and 4,000 alerts in a day, priming needs to be embedded in the system. To prime decisions in real time, we would need agents that are faster to think than a human can respond. The first agent comes in to provide a standard level of categorization. As we all know, we would like to address malicious ones to be handled first, and we can probably defer the benign ones later. However, you would still have thousands of alerts, as mentioned a while ago, and for the SOC team, maybe you have five or maybe up to 10 people in your SOC team, that would be still very overwhelming. These alerts need to be filtered to be able to remove noise. So let me take you through the journey of an alert going through the SecOps process. Take, for example, this suspicious alert. If it's an alert that involves a file that is flagged, our analyst would do a hash file reputation check. After that, they would look for any involved IPs and check the reputation. Then they examine different ETPs to be able to try to identify if there are threat actors involved. This is a typical external context enrichment that happens in a SOC. To improve it further, we examine how an asset is important to the business, and then we look at the confidentiality of what data the asset processes. We also consider the types of control that is active on that asset. And lastly, we do a baseline comparison of the behavior of that asset over the course of time. Then we validate that against a posture score, take a look at the alert history, and then try to get an understanding of how false positives were determined previously. By going through the SecOps process, your SOC team is able to be equipped with a higher fidelity prime. This is a common scenario where a higher severity alert downgraded to a lower priority. And similarly, for a lower severity alert, if enriched with proper business context, it can get to a higher priority. So if you have a priority for alert that you want to handle, for example, it is a 
device that is a printer. So you know it's not important to the business. And then you can decide that for this type of alert, I want to be only alerted weekly. Priming at this scale allows your SOC to be more efficient and to be able to handle the thousands of alerts in a better way. So when faced with alert flood, which is common, I think, to a lot of your uh, organizations, your SOC team would be able to prioritize the ones that really matter. So looking at beyond security, for example, you would have use cases that would be about your business, growing your business. That is also an applicable scenario where priming could also help. Take for example, in one of our clients, they actually looked at a scenario where they were investigating anomalous behavior in business transactions, which would help them to identify indicators of fraud, they were able to label and tag the data to have priming as a guide for their investigators, their fraud team, to start their analysis and investigation. As a bonus, it's very good because for this particular customer, they were able to use the same data source, which was used for cybersecurity and for the fraud investigation, to be able to generate multiple types of intelligence. If you're in an ER or triaging when you're in an ER or in a war room, priming really helps how humans respond. And with that, four core principles that I believe everyone should be able to uh, take away with you. First, Raw data in its raw format is not valuable on its own. It turns into valuable, powerful data if it's turned into context. Like in cybersecurity, you have the importance of an asset being able to determine how an alert should be handled. Because at the end of the day, data actually fuels priming. Second, when throwing AI at a problem, sometimes it actually does the reverse. It would accelerate confusion rather than helping address the situation. In a scenario where we deal with time-sensitive decisions, such as cybersecurity incidents, a detection rule that is configured real-time simple one. It's actually better than a complex AI model with a risk of delay. So always be intentional in how you use technology because maybe a rule is better than an AI model. Next, focus on what matters. For your SOC team, attention is the most limited resource. When your SOC team is spending a lot of time on low risk priorities or low, low risk alerts that leaves a lot of room for high impact threats that may be exposed. So we want to make sure that our SOC team works on what really matters to your organization. And as a theme of our forums and my talk today, this is what priming is all about. It's about starting every decision, not with additional alerts or more tools or more dashboards. Rather, it's starting with the right context, sent at the right time to the right people. So if you want to start talking and doing priming at scale, feel free to reach out and contact us. Thank you.